Our gospel this morning continues the reading from the gospel of Mark, the third gospel in the New Testament, or actually the second, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. First three are called synoptics. They basically tell the story from a historical perspective. And in Mark, in the first chapter of Mark, basically walks us through a day in the life of Jesus. And now he's teasing out the implications of that day. So we read, the crowd came together again so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. The crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mothers and my brothers? And looking at those around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Let us pray. Lord, may your words be spoken and your words heard. And we do ask this all for your love's precious sake. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> uh, you know, at St. Matthew's, one of the things that is really, really important to us is the voice of women, uh, the leadership of women, the full rights and privileges of women, and, and enjoying those rights together in the life of the church. And we, we just think that is absolutely critical. We think this is the model Jesus showed us. Uh, we think the church has been very poor at this uh, down through the ages and sometimes still is. And so it's important to us that we do everything we can to get that right. And so we love to have women preach, um, but as you know, our, our sort of our, our, our staff preaching rota is predominantly male. Well, we're all male, and uh, so we so we look wherever we can to hear women's voices, and we've searched uh, high and low, and we came upon this gem in our own backyard, and that is uh, a, a licensed a, a lay preacher, which is it was a lot of work, uh, and her name is Genevieve. And uh, you're in for a real treat. So, Genevieve. Good morning. Good morning. It's nothing like setting the bar high. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. All right. This is my first Sunday here. And so you're going to hear a little bit about me and my family. And it will all tie into the gospel, I promise. Just stick with me, okay? <laughs> My roots are in Savannah, Georgia. And if you know anything at all about the South, you know that I grew up with some pretty serious family expectations about what a young lady did and did not do. So these included such diverse pronouncements as, young ladies wear stockings with a dress. <laughs> and yes, a dress was worn to church every Sunday, uh-huh. <laughs> and also, most especially, Young ladies do not kiss their boyfriends on the front porch where the neighbors can see. <laughs> Raising kids is hard, and expectations are important, and I don't think God would disagree with that. Today, in our 8 o'clock service and our 11 o'clock service, we had Old Testament readings, and those are all about God's family. God is trying to raise his children, and it's really not going so well. What you might not know is that we were actually offered two choices for those Old Testament readings this morning. The Episcopal Church likes to call them tracks. And they're possibly the two times in the Bible when God's children are making their biggest mistakes. The first one is Adam and Eve. They're newly made. They're kind of God's toddlers. And they've been told not to touch the fruit. And what do they do? They could do the very thing they've been told not to. Human beings first big mistake 
the first rejection of God. And then our second choice this morning that we did hear in the earlier service was the story of God's people after they've reached the promised land. So God has brought them out of slavery in Egypt. He's parted the Red Sea for them. He's led them through the wilderness. He's given them manna to eat. He given, he's given them the everlasting covenant and the Ten Commandments. And he's brought them to the promised land. And God's new teenagers with their newfound freedom, they decide they want a king. And God patiently explains to them why this is a bad idea. And do they listen? Of course not. They want a king. All the other countries have one. <laughs> this, of course, also turns out to be a very big mistake. And I find it interesting that we have this morning these two stories, these times when God's children the very people made in God's image have wholeheartedly rejected what God is offering based entirely on their own assessment of how things should be. Adam and Eve take one look at that fruit and they think, well, this looks really good to eat, right? The people of God take a look at all the other country's leaders and they think, well, our leadership doesn't look like theirs does. That We want a leader that looks like leaders are supposed to look. And God, unseeable, unknowable, doesn't fit the image of the leader that they're comfortable with. So they reject him. They want a king that fits their mold. And these are the big mistakes. These are the moments when we as God's children have rejected what God is offering because it doesn't line up with how we think. But there are little ones every day. One rainy morning, I was driving my daughter to preschool, and I exclaimed, what a dismal day. And she pipes up from the back seat and goes, oh, no, Mommy, it's a beautiful day. We can jump in the puddles. <laughs> you see, when what God is giving us doesn't fit our mold, our first tendency is to reject God's grace rather than adjust our thinking. And whether it's the shape of our day or the shape of our family or the shape of our hearts, God has a tendency to break the mold. Jesus certainly did. He didn't fit the mold people had shaped for God. Healing on the Sabbath, dying on the cross, Jesus didn't fit the image of a Messiah, so people rejected him. And this is why we have the gospel. The enduring message of the gospel is that when we reject God, God embraces us. In our gospel story this morning, Jesus has broken the rules about healing on the Sabbath. He clearly doesn't fit the mold for a person sent by God. So the scribes reason, Jesus casting out demons must be a product of evil. They reject who God is and what God is offering because it doesn't fit their ideas about how God should act. But the good news of Christianity is that Jesus takes God's people at their worst, making their biggest mistakes, and he embraces them. Watch how Jesus does the three good things any good parent will do when their kid makes a huge mistake. First. He corrects them. He explains to them in terms they can understand using parables what their mistake is. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Of course, this power doesn't come from Satan because Satan would never cast out his own demons. Second, Jesus gives them a warning. Now, this part does sound scary. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Now, Jesus seems to be suggesting there might, in fact, be something we can do that God wouldn't forgive, and that's pretty awful. But I think what Jesus is doing here is not issuing some cosmic punishment. So he's not explaining what God will do to us if we commit this sin. He's explaining the natural consequences of rejecting the works of God and calling them evil. The real problem with that kind of rejection is that it risks missing God's spirit entirely. To call good evil 
is to risk being separated from God because of our own choice, our own rejection of what God is offering. Jesus is explaining what we do to ourselves when we reject God's healing and love and call it evil. So then we can never have forgiveness because we won't accept it. So this is really less of a threat and more of a warning like you might give your kid. It's basically Jesus saying, look, if you want to go mano a mano with the Holy Spirit, the awesome power that creates and sustains all of life, that's your choice. I, I can't really help you because a house divided against itself cannot stand. And me, God, and the Holy Spirit, we're a house. So after the correction and the warning, Jesus does the third thing that any good parent does after a big mistake. He demonstrates the good news. The good news is that Jesus takes God's people at their worst, making their biggest mistakes, and embraces them. Instead of saying the scribes have committed this awful eternal sin and offering up the traditional punishment of stoning, thank you very much, Jesus does something very interesting. And initially it seems unrelated. Because remember that while all this is going on, his family has gotten wind of this little encounter and they're worried about him. After all, Jesus has just implied that some very powerful people might be guilty of the worst possible sin. So they try to extricate him quietly. They send word that he should come out to them. And Jesus could have said, I gotta go now, my family's calling me. But he doesn't. Instead, Jesus appears to not only ignore them, but practically disown them. And this has always seemed disturbing to me. Jesus is ignoring his family, who is just trying to protect him. After all, he hasn't even had time to eat, right? And he seems to say that they don't matter to him any more than some other random person in the crowd that showed up to be healed. But what Jesus is saying is actually the opposite. We are not just related to our immediate family. We are all family, living in God's undivided house. We are all Jesus' mother, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins. Jesus isn't disowning his own family. He's extending it to embrace the world. We are collectively all of humanity, not just God's people, but God's family. Even in the moments when we're at our worst, even when we're just teetering on the edge of rejecting God entirely, Jesus opens up the human family to include everyone. Now, this statement and its timing is not an accident. The scribes are part of the family too. They are standing right there when Jesus says, these are my brothers. There is nobody, not even them, that isn't included. So Jesus explains their mistake and then says, they're part of the family. Now families are messy. They're often filled with people that we don't get along with, people we disagree with, people we find irksome or boring or guilty of questionable life choices. My brother-in-law is black. And I'll just let you imagine the stir this caused in my southern family. My parents and my sister barely spoke for almost a decade. My grandparents died never knowing my sister had gotten married, never knowing they had two great grandchildren they never met. When we choose to reject what God is offering us based on our own assessment of what fits our mold, we miss out on incredible possibilities of God's grace. So the point Jesus is making today is that no one, not us, not the scribes, no one gets to decide somebody isn't part of the family just because they don't match up with our expectations. But the good news that Jesus is living out this morning is that God continues to offer grace over and over again 
regardless. Next month, my parents, my family, and my sister and her entire family are spending one week together in one house at the beach. That's grace. And a phrase you'll probably hear pretty often during that week is, you come by it honestly. You see, I come from this family of klutzes, and when someone has just some, done something that is ridiculous or stupid or otherwise less than perfect, we had this saying passed down from generation to generation, and it's this form of, oh yeah, I totally get that, I've been there, we're related. And that's somehow reassuring. And it's reassuring, too, to know that we're part of this huge, messy, imperfect family of God in which everything can and will be forgiven. The message of the gospel, the good news this morning, is that God will continue to forgive us, continue to offer us grace, continue to be God, no matter how many times we choose to reject that. God's house is undivided, and we all live in it. There is no offense that cannot or will not be forgiven because when we reject God, God embraces us and then calls us to embrace each other. Welcome to the family. Amen.